Hey everyone, welcome to Our Small Footprint. My name is Nissa, and if you're new here, we are a family of eight who live off grid in Australia. It is time to start March's uh, food prep planning preserving videos. Uh, the way that I run the videos here, for anyone who hasn't been around before, it's dinner time, so the guinea fowl are coming past. Hello. Once again, it's like 5.30 in the afternoon and I'm finally getting out here to do a voiceover. Uh, it's, I've been a bit slack, so the I got back from shopping on... It's Friday and I got back last Friday, so a whole week ago, and I've put out the grocery haul videos and things like that, but I haven't got any food prep planning videos uh, up yet, just because I haven't had a chance to do the voiceovers, basically. I have probably five videos worth of content uh, to share, but just have not had time to do the voiceovers. So what regularly happens is that it gets to like 5, 5.30 in the afternoon, and I realise I haven't done it yet because I've spent the whole day doing the food prep, recording it, but haven't done the voiceovers. When I was at Mum's, I did manage to do the voiceovers over into a mic while watching the video which was a whole lot quicker than the method that I currently use which is typing out or writing out all my notes and then coming out and recording it and then matching it to the video uh, but I just don't have anywhere to do that here I could bring it out here to where I am but it's it's kind of hard enough just bringing the camera and tripod out let alone having to bring the computer and then I'd need somewhere to stand with the computer like I couldn't just sit here and hold it in my hand the whole time I'm doing it and it's all too hard so once we get the new rooms done the hope is that there'll be a little bit of a back deck uh, on the on the new rooms and of course the dogs are going off because I'm out here doing this that's just the way it works uh, that once we've got that set up there'll be a little spot that I can sit so you can still hear and see the animals and everything else but I can actually sit there and do the voiceovers more uh, regularly and with less hassle so that's the plan anyway but for now this is what you get uh, so this uh, video is actually from like the first to the third of March and it's actually just before I went on my grocery haul uh, my supply run because I finished off the prep videos at the end of February but I thought about just skipping these this couple of videos worth of stuff and just starting with the newer stuff but it's all relevant because it all carries through like the the way that I like to share this and the reason that I share the food prep and the planning and the preserving and that is because it all runs on to itself so what I do in one week will impact the food for the weeks to follow and that's the way it, it happens so some of these meals are based around stuff that I did earlier in the month or that are going to happen for later on in the month so I think it's worthwhile keeping it chronological and doing it that way so we're a little behind we're about two weeks behind uh, what today's date which is unusual for me normally we're only a few days to a week behind uh, but this is about like the first to the third of March or something along those lines it's just before I went does that sound right what is the dates yeah, I went on like the 7th, 6th, 7th, 8th, I think. So this is just before that. Uh, which makes sense to me and probably makes sense to no one else. But anyway, <laughs> that's the other problem with doing it at this time of the afternoon. I'm tired and worn out and it's really just not optimal. We need to figure this out. I need to figure this out. But anyway, thank you for joining me for these videos in the meantime while I figured it all out. So I'll get on with the voiceover for this few days of food and then I'll come back and I'll say goodbye. So I started off doing some yeasted English muffins. So normally I do overnight sourdough English muffins and I haven't made same day yeasted ones before and I decided to give it a go because I'm still just coddling my starter at the moment. But also the overnight temperatures are just so high that overnight doughs can be a little bit risky. They can be quite overproofed by the morning because it's just too warm overnight at the moment. Uh, so I'd have to do them like mid afternoon to get them bulked in the afternoon and then get them in the fridge overnight. And I just don't seem to be able to time it right. So I did some yeasted ones and I've been doing a lot of yeasted doughs because of that reason. English muffin dough has milk and butter, but no egg or, or oil, but no egg. So it's enriched, but only lightly. Um, but it's a fairly dense sort of a, a dough, a very small tight crumb dough, which is nice, but it has those craggy bits, which is what people like. When you break them open, it has those sort of pockets where the butter and everything goes into them. I had thoughts of making plenty for freezer breakfast sandwiches. I don't know how feasible it is though. Maybe later in the month when there's less prep to do, but when we, but then we have less food to prep as well. So. I'd probably have to buy like ham or bacon that's purposely left in the freezer for those. And then we've got the egg situation with the Goannas is a bit of an issue, but we do have fertile eggs coming. I'm going to do one last hatch before 
uh, it gets too cold uh, to so that by the time summer comes along we should have more laying hens again and we will bump our egg production up but we'll see how we go I tried to make a really big batch and overwhelm the KitchenAid so I did the double batch in the KitchenAid bowl but ended up having to split it into two to be able to fit it all into the in the bowl uh, which is I should have done that anyway I was being overzealous but you know one day I might have one of those big commercial mixes or something and, and it won't be such an issue uh, I put it all into this huge Cambro container from Susan. I've always loved the look of these, the nice square sides, the measurements on the side and everything, but I've never ended up buying them. I would really like to buy a few more. They're very distinctive, so the kids won't use them for leftovers, unlike like they use the Tupperware, because they look different, so they know that they're my baking containers, they're not leftovers containers, but they are very expensive. Uh, Susan bought me this one, did I say that? So I'm super grateful for that to give this, to be able to see the quality of them as well. Uh, I did start an Amazon wish list uh, as a side note. People keep on saying to do the wish list and I did do one, but I feel really, uh, well, I don't really know the best way to work them for a start because the stuff that I look at in Australia as a prime member may not be the most cost efficient way for someone else to buy it. And I don't, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how it works. I did one up, but I thought about things like these Cambros, but they're just so expensive and I don't need them. So why ask for them? Like I can manage without. So anyway, I did do it. I'll try and put a link in the description if I remember. There's a few things on there for the kids and a couple of things like I need some new SD cards and things like that. But really, we manage. We manage to get these things without, you know, so grateful, but you don't need to. <laughs> anyway. Uh, once I once it had doubled, I put it on the dough mat. Now, I don't do circles basically because it's fiddly. You cut a circle out, you have to roll it back out again. But you do, if you want the English muffins to have those sides with the craggy bits inside, you do want to cut your dough. You don't want to roll it into balls, which would save the whole cutting into circles and then rolling out again if you just rolled it into balls. But that doesn't always work exactly right. So what I do is I just cut them into squares. I just roll it out on the dough mat into like, if I'm doing a scroll or something, and then I cut them into squares. Now, circles are kind of more visually appealing for English muffins because that's what they are standard like. And I did look at the price of buying them from the supermarket. So Coles has the cheapest ones and they're $2.90 for a six pack. And I just, that's a lot of money for a bread product that I can make myself, but I'm not real sure what I'm gonna do here anyway. Uh, for now I did them how I normally do, I rolled them out into the big rectangle and then I was probably a little heavy handed rolling these out. Uh, you can be a bit more heavy handed with sourdough but this dough was a little less structured so I was probably a little heavy handed with them but they worked out alright. Uh, so I, and the, the dough seemed to deflate a little bit more as I was working it. I think that's just the temperatures more than anything but it, yeah. I cut it into squares because it's nice and simple. I put them on a tray with some cornmeal or semolina so they don't stick and cover with tea towels to get puffy again. Now you can cook these on trays in the oven. They're not quite as nice though in my opinion. Uh, and because I can only fit one and a half trays in the barbecue anyway, it's really not that much quicker for me to do it. So I like to steam them in the pan. I get the cast iron pan really nice and hot place them with a lid on to trap the steam and then I flip them. It takes about four to six minutes each side and like pancakes, <laughs> sometimes the first ones burn before they cook all the way through. So, you know, they go to the kids <laughs> uh, because the kids don't care or Daryl, he's happy to eat burnt stuff. But yes, the you have to get the pan at the right temperature so that you, you still have them in there for four to six minutes each side so that the middle is cooked all the way through without burning the outside edges. But having put them in that little bit of semolina or cornmeal means that you get some nice crunchy bits on the outside. And if they were round, you'd get the round marks in them. I get square marks because mine are square, but that's just the way it is. Uh, once cooked, I put them on a rack over a tray and let them cool like that. We served them with eggs and ham or bacon, mayo, breakfast sandwich like, and I made 48 out of that batch. Now it took me two and a half to three hours. So this is where I'm contemplating the feasibility of doing it in bulk because realistically, that's only like three meals for us. They're smallish, so two each. And at 48, that really only gives us three meals. Uh, they have a lot of hands-on time. Maybe I need to master more of like a light roll for breakfasts, uh, like a, just a hamburger style breakfast 
BAP or something, I don't know, uh, because realistically the, the amount of time taken to make English muffins may not be worth doing them in bulk. We do tortillas and flatbreads a lot too for like breakfast burritos or flatbreads and that, but they're always much nicer the first day and they have a lot of hands-on time too. Uh, so I think I'm going to try the Tangzong method, I don't know how that's pronounced, Tanzong, Tanzong, I'm not sure what that, how it's pronounced, method of heating your water and flour to keep your buns softer longer. Uh, you do that before adding it to the dough and it's supposed to keep them softer longer. See if that helps making things like rolls last for a few days nice and soft. We still eat them for a few days, you just toast them if you need to, but it would be nice to have bread that tasted more like it was baked that day for a couple of days, so we'll see how we go. Uh, I just wanted to show a quick shot of dinner that night. This was using that velveted beef from early in the month that I had frozen. So I'd velveted it, seasoned it and frozen it. I defrosted it in the fridge overnight and then the next day did a plum barbecue stir fry with frozen veg served over rice and it worked wonderfully. So for anyone who saw me freeze the velveted beef before, it worked out perfectly for cooking. I just defrosted it in the fridge and cooked it up. Next day, I wanted to use up some of those sweet potatoes, so I get sweet potatoes with food hampers pretty much every month. I don't buy them because I know I always get them with the food hamper, and I'm not a fan of sweet potato. Daryl and the kids don't mind it, but I'm just not a huge fan. They really love sweet potato gnocchi, which I make for them fairly regularly, uh, but it's kind of fiddly, and I like to make enough that there's a couple of meals worth when I do make it, so I didn't really feel like doing that. So what I decided to do was make like a mac and cheese, but with sweet potato. Uh, so I peeled and steamed up a bunch of sweet potatoes and then made my basic dairy-free cheese sauce in the Thermix, but a nice light liquidy one, not a not a stretchy starchy one that I'd use for like over nachos or something like that. Uh, because the starch and the sweet potato will help to thicken it up and then you've got the starch from the pasta as well. So I cooked it just like I normally would and then I blended through all the sweet potato into the sauce as well. I cooked off macaroni to al dente in a pot of boiling water. Uh, I also had a split chicken that I defrosted and roasted in the barbecue so I diced that up as well to put through the pasta bake. I could have put some frozen veg or some tin corn or something in this as well but I thought with the sweet potato and everything else it didn't really need it. Uh, so got the pasta in the pans and then split the sauce between the two lots of pasta and then mixed it through with that chicken as well. I topped both trays with the breadcrumbs, in this case it was cornflake crumbs because that's what I had, and got Daryl to drizzle a little ghee over the top as well that will help that to brown up on the top there too, and then put them in the barbecue to bake. Uh, I also made a quick cheese based one for myself because, you know, I could, and I really like mac and cheese. Uh, so I did a white a cheese sauce in the Thermix as well using actual cheese and mixed that one up the same way as I did theirs, just with cheese in it as well and with milk. So uh, this is what it looked like out of the oven and once served. It's lovely and creamy. The pasta is really nice and soft. Everyone wolfed it down. So everyone really liked it and they ate the rest of it for leftovers the next day. So I definitely will have to do that one again uh, because they didn't have a problem with the sweet potato in that cheese sauce and they really liked the whole mac and cheese sort of esque type meal. I mentioned that something else I had tried to do before heading off to the next grocery shop was to empty out my freezer as much as possible. So I went through the freezers to find as many carcasses as I could for making a big batch of stock. Uh, I used all the bones I could find, some frozen celery and carrot, I halved a couple of onions and put some big cloves of elephant garlic in there, salt, peppercorns and some apple cider vinegar as well before filling it up with water. I pressure cook my stock for 90 minutes. I find this is an optimal kind of time to get those bones to fall apart but also have lots of uh, colour and flavour in the stock as well. After that I strain out all the solids. I'm not pedantic about it. If you want a really nice clear stock you need to strain it through something really fine uh, like a jelly bag or a coffee filter or whatever. That's far too time consuming for me <laughs> but also I don't have a problem with murky stock. That murkiness is veggies and stuff like it's it's flavor so I don't I don't really care about it uh, so I just use a colander make sure there's no bones in it that's about it uh, some people like to refrigerate their stock overnight so that they can skim the fat off and then they reheat it the next day to can it I like fat in my stock because fat is flavor it just means that I take some extra precautions when canning it I make sure that there is plenty of head space and that I'm taking the temperature up nice and slow so that the jars don't siphon and that fat doesn't interfere with the seals I rarely have any issues and if I do, if something doesn't seal, I just stick it in the fridge and use it the next day. I did have one jar that I couldn't fit in the canner, this particular batch, and we used it over 
the dog biscuits for dog food for them so because I forgot to use it I filled all my jars cleaned the rims with a bit of vinegar put the rings and lids on rings go just fingertip tight for the ball mason jars uh, again thank you to Susan for these jars she sent me these uh, wide mouth quart jars they're going to come in very handy I double stacked the jars in my buffalo pressure canner I can fit 16 quart jars in here which is just super handy it's amazing to be able to do that many at once uh, and pressure can them for the relevant times for clear chicken stock while that was processing we started on some garlic so Karvik wanted to me to show you the picture he was coloring in so this is <laughs> the picture that he was coloring in prior to coming and helping me I bought five kilos of elephant garlic from Nikki Sharkey who sells it on the Garlic Growers Australia Facebook page if you're looking for some. Uh, I love the elephant garlic because it saves me from peeling tiny little cloves. Uh, the flavour is a little bit um, mellow I suppose. Uh, also potentially a little bit more acidic than some of the other types of garlic but we we don't mind it we have we don't mind the flavour of it at all and it does make life a whole lot easier to be peeling those giant cloves. One of the things I wanted to do with the garlic was fermented garlic and raw honey. We really adore this. It is supposed to have amazing properties for colds and sore throats and things like that. But to be honest, we rarely use it for those kind of things. We just like to eat it. Uh, the honey and the cloves are gorgeous in mayo. They work beautifully in marinades and they're tasty just drizzled over a variety of things as well. If you've got, for me who eats cheese, a bit of cream cheese on fresh sourdough with a little bit of that honey drizzled over is really, really good. Because the cloves are so large, I sliced them up before putting them in the jars. Mainly just so we could fit more in the jar, but also the larger the cloves, the longer it's going to take to ferment. So having the smaller pieces makes that easier. I have some Kilner fermenting lids. They have a one-way valve on them. It means I don't have to worry about burping them. And because I was doing this before going on the supply run, it meant that I didn't have to worry about Daryl burping them either. So they, you can use any jar you want, but if it's got a sealed lid, you just have to be aware that as it ferments, it's going to create gases and you need to burp your jars. Uh, it's, it's not... I don't, even with sealed jars, I don't think I've ever had one explode while fermenting, but there is a risk of it. So, you know... It's better off using a valve or making sure you burp it. Sometimes it's a good idea to have them sitting on a saucer too because they can bubble over and spill down the sides of the jar depending on how active the ferment is. So that's another thing to think about as well. So I mostly filled two jars with the garlic and then I covered it with the raw honey. That's it. Daryl got the honey for me from Hives in Toowoomba. It's a quite a nice tasting one. Uh, it's a little bit floral it's it's pleasant it's very light which might be the time of year um, and I do have I did get some really dark stuff last year that was very nice but it's it's very pleasant honey as the honey settles you may need to top it up a little and the garlic will float initially but as the honey liquefies with the fermenting process the garlic will drop and the garlic and honey will start to darken you can put a glass weight in there if you need to though uh, but I don't find it's necessary I find as soon as that garlic starts as soon as the honey starts thinning out then the garlic dips under the level of the honey anyway I put them aside for however long I feel it needs on the bench until all the sort of bubbling activity slows down. Then I cap them with a solid lid and I tend to store it in the fridge. You can store them on the shelf theoretically, but we have such fluctuating temperatures from negative eight Celsius to like 48 Celsius throughout the year that I don't like leaving things on my shelf unless they're heavily processed. Uh, Cause imagine the mess if it exploded on my pantry shelf, <laughs> that would be horrible, but also a waste. So I find it easier just to store it in the uh, fridge and it still continues to darken and it still continues to do its thing just at a much slower rate. Uh, and I don't, and it's, as I said, we tend to do it more for the flavor as a cooking ingredient rather than the health benefits of it too. So for us storing it in the fridge works. The solid to the stock had cooled down by now, so the next thing I did was to puree it up for dog food. Dog food. Now, every time I show this, I get questions in regards to the onion and the garlic in the food. I do pull the large chunks out that I find as I'm as I'm straining it, but at the same time, this food is served by the half cup to three large dogs on a daily basis. The toxicity of things like onion are around 100 grams per 20 kilos of body weight. Two of my dogs are about 20 kilos, the other one is about 25 kilo. So, uh, the toxic levels that's a lot that they would need to eat to hit toxic levels uh, and i'm sure some dogs are more sensitive than others but my dogs have never had a problem with it uh, 
they're not eating anywhere near enough to cause issues in the stock products that are being fed to them uh, because the stock is given with their standard dry food the dry food rations are just a little bit smaller when they've got the stock as well which just makes us lets us stretch that food but they really enjoy the the stock paste as well when we first got daisy she was a rescue and they weren't aware of how old she was and she ended up going on heat when we first got her uh, and a stray dog got in the yard or two or three got in the yard and she ended up pregnant and she had 15 puppies uh, and she fed those puppies all the way through till they weaned uh, she got mastitis at one point we had to go to the vets and do all sorts of things and the vets were asking how we kept her in such good condition and we mentioned that we've been making this stock paste for her as a regular food and they said that it was one of it was probably one of the only reasons that she managed to maintain condition while feeding that many puppies because of the high nutrient value in it so for us we're okay with it but it is definitely personal preference whether you are happy to do that or not you could always make your stock with no garlic no onion and then do it but I am comfortable with the quantity that's there because the stock's been pressure cooked you can see here that all the bones just crumble even with just the pressure of your fingers so they're no longer a risk of causing issues from shattering or anything uh, so what I do is I puree it all up with the excess veggies using the thermomix with some of the stock liquid sometimes I add other veg if I have it sometimes I mix some grains through but they get this served on the dry food so it's a well-rounded diet uh, if I'm not canning the stock for any particular reason, I sometimes put sweet potato or zucchini or anything in the in the stock when it's cooking as well, but it does create a very, very murky stock. So because I was doing a big batch for the can to be canned and put on the shelf, I decided not to put those veggies in this particular batch. But when I do, it, it bulks it out for the dog food. That night before bed, I mixed up some overnight bagel sourdough. I felt like my starter was healthy enough. Now, I did use both my starter jars. I have two, uh, mainly for accidental purposes. So I have come out of a morning at one point and one of the jars was tipped over and spilled everywhere. So I was grateful for the other jar. So basically I have two just in case of contamination or damage. Uh, so I just run two all the time. It also means that I can have smaller jars. Like if I, cause I use all the starter in both jars quite regularly and they run at about 300 grams of starter in each jar. So to have that much in one jar, I would need quite a large jar. So I find it easier to have two. Uh, but one of them is recuperating better than the other. And I'm not sure why that is because they both came from the same starter base. So maybe I missed feeding one at one point or something. I'm not sure. Uh, so one definitely didn't perform as well as the other, but I mixed the dough together anyway. So it all worked out okay. Uh, I did double batch. I do a double double batch, uh, and again, I can do a double batch in the, the KitchenAid, but I have to do two of those double batches. So I did it all, put it into the container, and left it on the bench overnight to come back to in the morning. The bagel dough is fairly forgiving. It's quite a stiff, low hydration dough, so it doesn't tend to overproof into slop, unlike a lot of other things. So I was comfortable doing it in these temperatures. In the morning I boiled it up into approximately sort of 90 gram balls. I do tend to weigh this because I want them to be fairly consistently sized for cooking purposes. We're going to boil them and we're going to bake them so if they're fairly consistent, consistently sized they're going to boil and bake more consistently as well. I boil the dough up into balls, let it sit and relax for a bit, then starting at the beginning again I put the hole in the middle. I prefer this way of doing it rather than a sausage and trying to get the joint to stick. This works just works better for me. So I stick my thumb through and then I do a bit of a swirl and then I use my fingers to stretch it out a bit. As I put the holes in them I transfer them to baking trays that are lined with some semolina or cornmeal so that they don't stick to the trays just to let them get puffy again. As I work through with this quantity I find by the time I get to the end the first lot are ready to go. I bring a large pot of water to the boil and add some honey. I boil the bagels on each side for about 30 to 60 seconds or you know however long they sit before I remember that I've got a batch in there boiling or that they need to be flipped or you know anything like that. Uh, the longer you boil them theoretically the thicker the crust is going to get you're going to create more of a crust it's going to be chewier. So I prefer them on the 30 to 60 second side rather than longer. I used to do them longer until I realized that and I prefer the thinner crust if I can do that. Then I put them on a rack over a tray. Because I bake in the barbecue, I find that if I put them directly on the stainless steel or aluminium tray, they burn on the bottom before they're browned on top. So by baking these on the racks, I seem to have solved that. It does mean I get rack marks in the bottom of them, but that's fine. Once they cool a little to handle little temps, I dip them in seeds. I go a little overboard on seeds. I really like seeds. I make up a batch of basic everything but the bagel seasoning, you know, poppy seeds, sesame seeds, garlic granules, some onion granules and flaked sea salt. Uh, I like this sprinkled on just about anything. 
uh, dip them while damp and place them back on the tray to go into the oven and repeat and repeat and repeat. <laughs> Uh, bagels are always better that first day, but they do taste toast up really well for a couple of days. And if after that there is any spare, they make really delicious breadcrumbs, especially with that everything but the bagel seasoning in there as well. We served them with eggs and bacon and mayo and onion jam, and they were fantastic. I have to time it right with overnight doughs, but if I can, it really is worthwhile. Uh, it's something that when the weather cools down that I do overnight doughs a lot, and even when we're running the fire, because it's warm right up until like midnight, but then we let the fire go out by morning, it's cool enough that they can even proof overnight inside in winter. So we, I've got that pretty damn pat. It's definitely summer that I struggle with my sourdough with more than winter. Even I know a lot of people struggle with the cool attempts in winter, but because I suppose because we have a wood stove, even if the stove isn't, if there's no fuel added to it in the morning, the stove is still warmish. But I'm nearly always using something on the barbecue so I can put it beside, I don't know, I, I don't really struggle with sourdough in winter, but I definitely do in summer, which is just a bummer. But it just means I rely more on yeast to doughs over summer, and that's fine too. Uh, I don't, like, you know, there's the whole thing that sourdough is supposed to be better for you because it's longer ferment and it breaks down some of the um, proteins and all that sort of thing. I don't know. None of us seem to have a particular issue with gluten. Uh, so or any sort of wheat based breads so I don't know that we need sourdough for the benefit the health benefits but it can't hurt and I like the taste of sourdough so I definitely enjoy using sourdough um, and but I don't have an issue with yeast either so we do what we need to do to get by when we need to for whatever the purpose is <laughs> it is what it is uh, so that was the first few days of March so I will try and get the next few up over the next couple of days I did receive a um, an item from Vivor a chamber vacuum sealer um, that they contacted me and asked me if I was interested in anything and I told them that my vacuum sealer had died and that if they could give me one of those that would be fantastic and so they did so I have to do a video for that. I will do that probably later in the weekend. We've been filming all the bits and pieces, getting to know it over this last few days, and I'll put it all together and I'll share that as well. Uh, so that will be out over the weekend probably, and we'll just have more food videos going coming along. Uh, one more from pre-grocery run, I think, and then the re we'll start on the stuff following that. So thank you for bearing with me again, and I will see you guys on the next video. Bye.